So I guess uh, just we ready, we set to go. Cool. Well, thank you guys for having me very much. I'm a huge fan of Rock Curse. I drank the Kool Aid a long time ago and uh, went through the MBA program as we were talking about a little bit ago from '91 to '93. And uh, we had the group over uh, for a tour on Saturday. And I was talking about um, how, in some respects, it just seems like it was just like a couple of years ago. It goes so fast. But what I learned, um, we didn't have, you're learning a lot more about small business entrepreneurs than we did in our in the executive MBA, I can tell you that. Um, but they don't all, I guess, they don't come in and say, come, we'll teach you how to write a business plan or we'll teach you how to start a company. That's not their deal. But I'm now learning things that I learned in, you know, 20 years ago in the MBA class, which is, which is really cool. And one of my professors said, you know, the real value, real learning grows over time if you learn it the right way. And I think the Jesuits do. You don't memorize it. You learn it. You get it. And then it sticks. So anyway, so I have my assignment here. Um, but what I, uh, this will be very informal, obviously. And I'll just kind of maybe do the short story on kind of how we how I got to here and then love to have all the questions you guys have and I told the Rockers group on Saturday I by no means want to give you the impression that somehow we got it figured out or we made it or we did it I had I don't feel any of that I don't think anybody on my team does either it's a uh, very much a game day tension for us every day is a new day and uh Bill Gates in his book said, you know, he doesn't, he's not afraid, but he runs scared as if somebody could come up with something that would make a Windows obsolete tomorrow. And I had that same feeling that, and as, a, you know, I used to play football and we had that same, the minute you thought that you weren't going to get beat or couldn't get beat is when you got beat. So I never ever, I never want to have that, um, that characteristic in our company and I don't, I don't ever want to feel that. So, but anyway. Well, net-net, um, I grew up in this little tiny town in Iowa, middle of 10 kids, and um, when I was a senior in high school, I was dating this girl from Australia who was our foreign exchange student, and I thought, huh, that'd be cool. And just on a total whim, I, I signed up. Today they'd say I was an entrepreneur, you know, back then it was stupid or um, crazy or whatever, you know. But I did it, and um, so... I got a letter in January that said I was going to be going to Costa Rica in uh, February of my senior year, and, and I had put down I wanted to go to West Germany, that's how old I am, and um, in Australia, where my girlfriend was from. And uh, But I didn't speak a word of Spanish, hadn't been out of this state with anybody outside my family, never been on a jet, and um, it was just, it was crazy, so I just was plucked down and uh, was absorbed by this family with two daughters and a cousin that lived with us. And um, so I, I uh, got on with, you know, life in there and learned Spanish and started school. And and, uh, and um, that summer, my, my friends were going coffee picking and asked me to go with them. And I, I went and, and I just loved it. It was in Iowa, we... Walk beans, eat tassel corn, chop thistles, fix fence, bale hay, all this kind of stuff you do in a small farming town. And down there, they were, you know, you could work on pineapples or bananas. And and so my best friends were going coffee picking, so I loved it. And I'm, I didn't drink coffee at the time, but I love farmers. I love anybody who works uh, in the dirt. They just, I just have this kinship with them, I guess, whether I'm in Ethiopia or Brazil or. It doesn't matter. And um, so I loved it. Came back, went to undergrad at Iowa State. And KU fans? I won't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, so went to Iowa State undergrad, and, and I came. I got out in 83, and the, and the economy was just horrid, just horrible. For me personally, it, today is nothing compared to how it was in 1983. 18% you know, interest rates, and oh, it was just horrible. But... I signed up for every interview I could get, and I had two. I had one at Armstrong Floors, and the other one was the CIA. And I thought, huh, that'd be fun. 
So I started this 18-month interview process with the CIA, and at the end of that, I got a little one-page paragraph that said I wasn't going to be hired. So I kind of got dumped into the market, and the only job I could get was in sales, which is, you know, dumb luck. And um, and plus, you don't see a lot of six-foot-eight spies running around, so I wouldn't have been doing anything interesting. I would have been stuck in some cell, in some building, some cube, uh, doing analysis or some crazy stuff. So thankfully, um, it didn't happen. And you know one thing I, I was thinking about... Um, if I was going to talk about this tonight, it's, uh, there's always these turning points, right, in your life. If, if you think even as un- young as most of you are, if you stop right now, you look back, and how did you get here? And you're not always conscious of them. You know, when I was picking coffee, I didn't think, huh, later in my career, this could be a... It didn't cross my mind. It was just fun. It was with the Latins and living in the moment, and life was good. But that's how each one of these... Um, kind of happen if you if you think about it so the next one then so that the CIA was a, a big turning point sales was another turning point later I got this job with the company headquartered out of Seattle that was a major turning point because I started drinking coffee as soon as I went through finals as an undergrad and um, so then I got I drank so much coffee people thought it was weird I was really into it when not that many people were into it anyway so uh, hanging around Seattle a little bit, um, late 80s, early 90s, uh, another turning point. I went to Russia a couple of times in, in the early 90s as a, as a consultant, supposedly to try to help, um, it was a volunteer deal, to help with help them transition into a market economy. And um, we, I don't think we taught them anything, but we sure learned a lot. And a uh, huge turning point for me in that, and at that point in time, I, I had loved my job for like six years, and then if my job, well, they had changed leadership, and I really became extremely unhappy with it. Had a great job, well paid. And, um, but when I was in Russia, in my own way, I felt, I saw the, <clears throat> this fire and passion in the Russians that I felt like I used to have. And it was, my situation was just kind of beating it out of me. Uh, <coughs> excuse me so um, I came back just hell bent on doing something different I was up, I was upstairs at this time um, and I thought maybe t- I've always been kind of in- compulsive and impulsive and I thought maybe take me a couple of weeks to figure out what I was going to do and the weeks turned into months and all I could think about was coffee and then I started dreaming about coffee and 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 then my friends in the class in the MBA class were like you're so high energy, you'll go crazy. Oh, and in a coffee shop, you're nuts. And then I was depressed because it was the only idea that I had. And I was like, ugh. So I signed up for the United Nations Volunteer Program and and started the process for uh, Peace Corps. But I couldn't drop the coffee thing, so I just took a... Hey, how old were you at this time? 32, I think. And... Um, but, and I'd, I'd still love to do the Peace Corps. It's probably not going to happen now, at least for another 20 years or so. But, um, but so I thought, and this is interesting again, um, at least I think it's interesting. Um, at the time, I read this book by John Scully. Remember John Scully? You know, the guy who ran Pepsi, who Steve Jobs brought over to run Apple. And he, he had taken a year's leave of absence. And um, I thought, that sounds really good. And um, so I opened up our, we had a, like a phone book for an employee handbook, and I opened it up, and there was a, and there was a leave, leave of absence in there. And this was 93, and the economy again was horrible. And I had a, you know, great job, and, you know, made decent money, and, and everybody thought I was nuts, except for like two people, my classmates upstairs, thought, thought you know, it was a good idea to pursue it. So anyway, I called my boss up in Seattle. I said, "Hey, I want to, I want to take a year's leave of absence." He goes, "What? You know, what the hell are you talking about?" And I told him, and and I said, "It's in the handbook. I have to cuss when I say this." He goes, "You're shitting me." And I said, "No, it's in there." And well, you uh, 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 and we just talked a, a while. He goes, "Well, you're really unhappy, aren't you?" I said, "Yeah." 
And he talked me into staying until the end of when I graduated from Rockhurst, which is June 1st of 93. And I knew I wasn't going back. He knew I wasn't coming back. And uh, it was just a, it was a, it was today you'd say, I'm quitting, I'm dropping out. And everybody'd go, cool. Well, mm-hmm. back then it wasn't so cool. People thought it was weird, something was wrong. Why would you leave this job, especially in this economy? Da, da, da. So I just, it, I felt that at that point unencumbered. Then I just, I went um, all over the country looking at what people were doing with coffee. Went back down to Costa Rica several more times. Scared to death at the same time, but um, but I also was just really intrigued. And um, so I came across Air Roasting, and um, which was out in Montana, and loved, loved, loved the taste of that. It was just so smooth and rich and mellow and creamy and non-bitter. And which led me to this um, old crabby guy up in Corvallis, Oregon, who who built these uh, roasters in this old church. And um, so I had one. Uh, I ordered one. Spent a week with him. Learned how to roast and uh, learn how to operate. I didn't learn how to roast. And um, and then just came back to Kansas City and started knocking on doors. And I found the old log book in a. The roaster was installed September of that year, and um, I had not. And then I went until December without selling a single pound of coffee. So September, October, November, December. I heard somebody mention passion earlier, and that would be for me the first 20 most important, hugely dark days, incredible obstacles, and who knows what they are, but it won't be dollar signs or it won't be lifestyle that you're thinking about when you're you're going through that it's you know it's going to be this passion that you draw from intrinsic or from within and um, so anyway I I finally made a sale and um, and then another and then another and that's kind of how we how we started the company it was my dog Chewy and I and um, so little by little by little but those three months I'm telling you I was absolutely scared out of my mind and uh, I told the guys on Saturday, all guy class, by the way, <laughs> kind of weird. Um, I said, if, it reminds me when I talk about that, uh, that fear, when that, in 1991, I think, I was um, up in Vancouver, British Columbia, and I was going to go bungee jumping. And I couldn't wait. I love scary, edgy, adventurous things. And it got to be my turn, and I went up and I looked down, and oh my God, I get goosebumps every time I think about it. It's like 140 feet down. And I thought, oh, I'm not doing this. And I turned, and there were a bunch of girls lined up to go. <laughs> and I wasn't going to walk by them and, and not do it. So I just made myself jump. And that's the same notion that I had of not quitting. If I could have quit and slid back into corporate or done something and not had that, I knew you weren't going to make it or... I, I knew it wasn't going to work. I swear to God, I would have quit every day multiple times. And uh, but that fear, you know, is with anybody. It can, you know, it can motivate you or it can um, immobilize you. It just depends on how, what, it, what effect it has. That fear of failure scares me to death, and I'm still scared of needles and doctors. Uh, but most other things, I'm very, I'm not really afraid of. Danny, so. can you talk a little bit about that mortgage payment? I'm yeah. Afraid. I think that, that can kind of make it a bit more concrete for them about your fear. You bet. So I, I had uh, um, so I had seventeen thousand dollars saved up. I bought the roaster for twelve thousand, so now I have five thousand. And um, I set out to buy a car. I went. I started at zero. I wanted to find a car for free, and I I found a seventy seven, I think Chevy Impala, for eight hundred bucks. And and so I'm driving around and I'm stopping two blocks, a block, three blocks away from wherever I'm going because I don't want, I don't want people to see what I'm driving because they're going to come up and it's like the emperor has no clothes. You know, this guy doesn't have any money. I'm not going to spend any time with him. I was looking at real estate and stuff and of course they'd see my car and there would be no meeting, you know. And um, in fact, Laura Rourke, who runs the downtown, uh, the culinary center downtown, Overland Park, is a good friend of mine. She was a really high-powered attorney at the time, and she incorporated us. And I remember driving, uh, parking a couple blocks from her house when, when I went to her house. Um, but so then I had... Uh, I used, This story used to be more compelling than it is today because with the financial crisis,